Uh, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Yes, we are a webinar. You can call us that. We will not be too offended by it. <laughs> um, we do um, live every week. Um, the show is free and open to anyone to watch. Um, and if you're unable to join us in, um, when we do the live show, you can join um, uh, watch all of the recordings on our archives on our website. Um, the show is live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, we do a mixture of things here, presentations, interviews, book reviews, mini training sessions. Um, basically, if it's library related, we are happy and I want to have it on the show. And we do a mixture. Um, we have guest speakers that come in and we have Library Commission staff that come in um, and do presentations. And this week we have a mixture of that. Mm -hmm. um, what we have this week also is our monthly Tech Talk. Um, once a month, usually the last Wednesday of the month, um, we have our Tech Talk with Michael Sowers. Michael is our Technology Innovation Librarian here Morning. at the Nebraska Library Commission. And he comes on once a month to do more, more techie-focused um, things, generally speaking. Um, and, uh, and tell us of any, any tech news of, since the last time he was here, mm -hmm. a month ago. Um, and he brings in speakers and um, interviews and whatever, and he has done that today. And I'll just hand it over to you guys to right. um, explain what's going on this morning. Great. Cool. Thanks, Krista. Uh, so today's guest we actually have in studio. Mm. This is yay, because uh, they're remodeling or you know, moving your office. Moving offices. So good, good way to, to get out of the way. Uh, <laughs> Marcia Doherty Baker, the Access Services Librarian at the Schmidt Law Library at UNL. Uh, is going to talk about a topic uh, near and dear to my heart and one we've covered from other perspectives uh, in the past. So we'll get a, a, a different perspective here today as somebody who, who uh, does do some hiring too. So mm -hmm. uh, some, something to think about. And how big is your uh, digital footprint? What is your online presence like? So uh, Marcia, why don't you just tell us a little about, about yourself and then go ahead and take it away. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Good morning, everybody. It's fun to be down here. Um, this topic also is near and dear to my heart. It happened a couple years ago. I was talking to some fellow librarians, and we were just, you know, chatting about all the different places we are online and how do you keep up and manage stuff and kind of realized that, you know, nobody had really thought about that after we've been signing up for all these free accounts under the sun, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you realize, like, whoa, what's all out there and where am I and... How do, you, how do you train up the next generation of people? Um, one was media center specialist, and she was like, you would not believe what kids post online. And so this was kind of one of those conversations where all of a sudden it was like, you know, light bulb, what do we do? And so I've been paying attention to this topic. I've given this presentation to a variety of groups the um, last couple years in different formats. And it's a lot of fun because it's one of those where you're like, whoa, that is probably something we should do something about, but what? Um, so I have some best practices I'd like to suggest from the reading that I've done. But I also think it's an awareness issue. As um, you know, librarians and information science tech people, we're used to using the Internet, um, but we have a little bit more of an arm's length opinion of it where kids in high school and our college students have grown up with it that it's part of their lives and they don't always see some of the boundaries that are out there. So I'm hoping that today not only is an awareness for everybody who's using technology, but as you know, information professionals, it'll give us some things to think about as people are asking those questions or we're given the opportunity to talk about it with students. So I have a Prezi. I'd like to do some slides with that, a couple infographs I want to show. I am very open to questions. I love those questions. And um, go ahead and, and let Krista know, or if you want to talk as well, that's great. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. The first thing I'd like to do is just basically talk about what online presence is and then like I said do best practices short and sweet that way because it is a lot of content to think about um, it's not one of those things that's necessarily easy or simple but it's things that we need to be aware of so go ahead and start the Prezi here and yes I'd like to use my keyboard so how big is your digital footprint and one of the things that this whole word keyword digital footprint that's coming up a little bit more if you start doing some keyword searching and that kind of thing. A lot of people say um, managing online presence, and I know there's other library groups that have done that. Use that as a keyword search, you're going to find it. Online presence gets kind of tied in with um, online management or online presence management and online reputation management. Um, but I like the idea of a digital footprint because we all have a digital footprint whether we realize it or not. And it's one of those things that like your footprint um, in the physical world, uh, especially if you're somebody who recycles and you use your bags at the store and, you know, you try and live a smaller footprint, um, you realize that, you know, you do take up so much space. 
And the same thing happens in the digital world. You do take up more space than you expect. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, some of us have been using technology for a long time. And we'll get into some dates here in a little bit. And so there's more of you out there than you realize. And so um, what we need to think about is who are we online? What are we doing online? Privacy and setting some boundaries. And then also the best practices. So the first thing I really want you to do is to Google yourself. And I know those of you that are listening, this is a screen. Open a new tab. Get your device out, your iPad, your whatever. And go ahead and Google yourself and see what happens. Now, that being said, don't just Google yourself. Use the other uh, search engines that are out there in the other browsers, and also do it besides being in your office. Do it at home, do it at the public library, do it on public Wi-Fi, because what's going to happen, and this is a different conversation to itself, is filter bubbles. Um, your browser and your computer are starting to know you, scarily enough, mm -hmm. and they're going to give you the results they think you want to see. So this is the results from my computer at work on my uh, library's Wi-Fi. And I Googled myself. I put my name in quotes, Marcia Doherty Baker in quotes. Um, I do have three names. And so this is what I found. And um, interestingly enough, for me, this made me very happy. The first thing that came up was my library uh, faculty page. And then you're going to see the LibGuides, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Flickr, and then there's a bunch of other ones. And then you see photos in there. Now, the reason that the library faculty page made me very happy is I have worked really hard to... Uh, explain to our faculty and, and whatnot why it's so important to have a really good faculty page. When I Google all of our faculty at the law school, this is the first hit that they get, which is really important to me because it's become their landing page. And from the faculty page, we have links to their publications in SSRN and in the UNL Digital Commons. We have links to Twitter. Uh, half of our faculty are using Twitter. We have the, probably the highest amount of law faculty using Twitter out of uh, many of the law schools out there. Um, they're using other things such as Cali, which is a, a, a legal online tutorial option that they can create tutorials for their students, so we want to promote that. They have their classes, their research areas, publication, you name it, it's there on their faculty page. We know a lot of students are looking to see who is going to be teaching their classes. Um, a lot of their colleagues in the field want to know what type of research they're doing. So that faculty page is really important, and having that show up first is really good. Next is LibGuides. You're going to find that just for our, our librarians, of course. That's not going to be a, a, a law faculty thing. LinkedIn's there, and then the picture. So for me, I was pleased with this. There was nothing embarrassing. Um, there was nothing I was like, whoa, I didn't know I was there. Um, that takes a couple pages to get in to be like, oh, yeah, I remember when I signed up for that account. So not only do you Google yourselves, you also want to check the images. And uh, the images, you can see there's just a, a preview here of a couple images for me. I think you, Michael, took some of these pictures. They're from a conference the at NLA. black and white one, yeah, I think, maybe. Yeah. NLA a couple <laughs> years ago. So that's been a few years, and they're still coming up um, just last week. So photos are going to be around forever. But check the images option when you go ahead and, and Google yourself, because you're going to find some interesting things. Now, last fall in October, I gave this presentation to a group of law librarians. And uh, so I told everybody, you know, Google yourself, and you could hear everybody busily you know, doing that in the room. And then all of a sudden, when I said, check the images, there was a shriek. And I was like, is everything okay? <laughs> and uh, this librarian said, yes, yes, everything's fine. Uh, I'll tell you after the fact. Said, okay. <laughs> and so we went on. And after the show, or after the program, she came up to me. I'm like, is everything okay? I, you know, I, that's, that's the first time somebody shrieked when I said, check the images. And she said, yes. She said, but what I didn't expect to find was a picture of me at the Vatican with a group. And she said, I'm not, you know, worried about this. I, I took this tour. I was with this group. We, we did the, the tour and stuff. They snapped our photo. But she said, I didn't realize that was going to be there with my name. And what had happened is she had helped uh, with this group and she signed the waiver form saying, yes, you can use my photo. And her name was attached to the group picture. And just because, you know, you think you're managing your online presence doesn't mean other people aren't as well. So that was kind of a first indication of, wow, this is something to be aware of. Um, another person came up after that and said, you know, our, our son's school media center specialist told all the kids, do not have any pictures taken of you with a red solo cup because of the implication of what that might mean. And I was like, wow, I didn't even think about that, but way to go, you know, media center specialist talking to your kids in high school about, you know, thinking and being proactive about what is out there and the environment that you're going to be in and those photos that are going to be taken. You know, if you're in Facebook, usually it'll say somebody's tagged you in a photo. But, you know, if you've signed the release form, if you've given permission for them to use your photos and that kind of thing in their online publications, you could appear in places that you didn't expect. 
not necessarily bad places, places or anything wrong with it, but you're going to be out there and you've lost some control over your, what are you thinking? Well, I, 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 I two things, but I guess the red solo cup, I guess, at what point is it too far? Too far. I agree. Obsessing I agree. About, I agree. You know, people use red solo cups at family reunion picnics. Reunion picnics. I, I mean, know. you know, and it doesn't mean you're, you're doing you're, yeah. something bad. I mean, at what point mm -hmm. does it, it, you're too concerned? Yeah, no, and I agree with you. And I thought <laughs> you're talking about teenagers, right? Teenagers. Okay. You're yeah. talking about that, no, no, I, I, yeah, no. You're right, but I also have. I mean, I control what I'm like out there, and I've said this before. You will find pictures. You will find pictures of me online. You'll find stuff about me that is both personal and professional. Mm -hmm. You will find pictures of me. I am an adult with a drink too. Mm -hmm. Now you won't find any pictures of me like naked dancing on the bar. However, <laughs> so you do, you know, control what's out there to whatever level is your comfort level. Too. Yeah, and I agree. I think you know how much is too much control over an image, and I get that. But I do think it was a, it was a good way to really capture teenagers' attention. Sure. And if okay. that's what she was mm -hmm. going for, then I applaud her for that. Okay. I think that's okay. good. I mean, You're making them think. Making them think is a good thing. Um, you know, and some people are going to be like, well, I'm going to get as many pictures with, you know, cups as I can. And other people are going to be like, you know, big deal. So what, you know. Um, but like I said, I, you know, if it starts mm -hmm. the conversation. Sure. To me, that's important. Sure. And, and that's kind of what this is when you Google yourself, see what's out there. Um, now, you're not going to really find any personal stuff. And we're going to talk about personal versus public or the professional versus the private person. Um, online because I don't post that. There's places I purposely don't join or post to because I don't want that out there. I've really worked to just have a, a professional image online and, and that's what I look at. Now, um, just as a, a disclosure, I do tend to Google myself on a regular basis. I've set up Google Alerts for a lot of things at the law school, the law library, and myself because it's easy to use me as a guinea pig and it's not so stalkerish. Um, just maybe a little obsessive compulsive. Um, Self-stalking. Self-stalking, but um, it works because then you can see what's out there and you can monitor. And the other thing is, it also gives you an awareness issue of, of what's happening. And um, so, you know, you know, don't do it all the time, but a regular basis would be good. You, you mentioned not just using Google. I would also say um, Google yourself, but sign out of your account first. Yes. Mm -hmm. That way, you're getting a less of the, the filter bubble, and mm -hmm. it's you know, it's it's kind of a, a cleaner search. Yeah, yeah. I guess clear your be. cookies and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's why I suggest using um, like a Wi-Fi at the library, or at uh, Starbucks mm -hmm. or some other place, um, and somebody else's device. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, try somebody else's, or you know, borrow their computer and Google yourself and see what happens. So, you know, what sites are coming up on the first page? You know, that first top or that top ten hits. That's going to be a big deal. Go to the second page and see what's there. Um, you know, are you okay with this? And now we all give ourselves enough grace and we'll be like, oh, that's all right. You know, I kind of get that. But if this was somebody else, how would you feel about that? You know, that kind of thing. And then is this information appropriate and is it accurate? You know, if you're going to have your colleagues look at this, if you know people are Googling you, because we all Google each other, let's be honest here. You know, anytime you, you're interested in something, you just Google it or you search engine it. Um, you know, how would you feel if you saw these results coming up about somebody else? Um, if you're job searching, is this what you want employers to see? Um, and if you're looking to to be a good candidate, is this what, you know, do you want to explain some of the stuff in a job interview? And I know that that happens. They say, well, you know, we saw this online. Can you explain that? Um, so definitely, you know, pay attention to that kind of thing. And that's the other reason I do this presentation is I have law students that I supervise that have come out of undergrad. And then they're going into law school, and it's like, okay, I have three years to become a professional, and I'm going to start looking for jobs and clerking. Oh, boy, there's a lot of stuff out there, you know. And so it's the idea, idea of cleaning yourself. I, I had a friend of mine recently, a colleague, professional colleague, um, email me and said, hey, you know, yeah, you, you took this picture of me at conference four or five years ago. I wasn't feeling really well that day. And, and I, it's not, it wasn't a bad photo, but he wasn't looking the best he could. And he's like, could you take that down? I recently got divorced on dating again. <laughs> and your photo comes up when someone Googles me. Oh, wow. And I went, sure, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take that down. You know? <laughs> so, well, and so it's not just job hunting in some it's cases. It's not just job hunting. And that's good. Thank you for mentioning that. Because, you know, if you find stuff out there that you don't like, there, you know, there's the panic mode, but it's like, you know, all the other stages of anything else. Um, contact the person who posted it and ask if they would remove it. For, for most people, they will. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I have. Yeah. You know, it's and it's okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with asking, and that would be the first place to start. So um, what I have here on the screen, and this is going to be, this link is in the resources at the end. Um, this is the digital you. Now, it's a little dated. It's from 2012. But what I like about this infographic 
is it really talks about who you are online and how we're using uh, the internet and that kind of thing. So I want to scroll down. You are searched, and I don't know if this is going to show up really good. This is right here. Um, but in the first half of 2012, people, um, people search engines were used over 240 million times to find information about individuals. And that doesn't include the searches done for individuals on Google, Bing, or social networks. So we have a ton of people that are searching for people. I mean, it used to be you would you know, maybe call somebody or you'd see somebody and be like, hey, do you know so-and-so? Not, you don't even bother doing that anymore. You just, you know, search for people. No big deal. Now, that is a huge search, but I want to also mention this little stat up here. 82% of children have an online presence before the age of two. That's kind of scary. I mean, how many of those Facebook photos do you see of kids in utero? I mean, we have kids that have an online presence, and they're not even here to participate on their online presence. Um, so sometimes people ask, well, how long is it going to take for this to get figured out? Well, honestly, until our first... Um, president is somebody who has been online their entire life, things aren't going to change. Because what's appropriate now and what we're okay with people knowing is different. But in 10, 15 years, you know, I'm thinking like what, maybe the 2024 election at the earliest, um, that's when things are going to change. And we're going to have to have a new uh, sense of okay with what's out there online. Because privacy is going to become a commodity and you're not going to be able to um, you can't use all the stuff that's out there against people because everybody's going to have something. All those skeletons are going to be exposed. And so it's really going to change how we view each other and, and information and that kind of thing. I was just making a note of uh, Jeff Jarvis from CUNY has a term called mutually assured humiliation. Yeah. Right. You know, so eventually everybody will have something online yeah. that they don't want anyone to see yeah. and it just washes out. You know, and I mean, yeah, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, at some point that's really how it's going to be. But until then, we are going to have this generational... Um, kind of um, <clears throat> battle lines, so to speak, on what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. You know, like I said earlier, we all have kind of an arm's length view of technology because we we didn't have a childhood with technology. But if you've always grown up with technology, I mean, everybody's seen a little kid who goes up to any screen out there and tries to swipe it to make it work. I mean, that's just a natural mm. occurrence for little kids anymore. Where for us, we're looking at it and we're like, dude, you can't swipe that. That's an old TV, you know, whatever. Um, but for them, everything should be something you can swipe. So, you know, things are going to change. It's just the evolution is going to take a little bit longer. Um, the other thing I want to talk about here is I know that some of the people that are listening, you know, you're librarians, you're already in school, or I'm sorry, you're already uh, on the job and you're a professional and stuff, but we do have people that we're helping um, every day that are trying to get into school or they're trying to get a job. And this I found was interesting. It's from 2012, like I said, but 70% of colleges say a candidate's Facebook profile is a priority in the admissions process. And that's kind of scary if you think, you know, you've only been on Facebook a couple years and already you're being held um, in account of what's there. That That is something that's interesting. And go ahead. Well, I was just reading a very interesting article on that particular issue in that um, a student didn't get into a college because of how they presented themselves on Facebook. Mm -hmm. But... And, and 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 I want to phrase all this carefully to get it right, but because what what it was kind of like on Facebook, he was presenting himself more as like gangsta, mm -hmm. but he was a straight A, perfectly well behaved student because the kids in the neighborhood mm -hmm. is who he was marketing to on Facebook, Facebook to show how he was, but that's not what mm -hmm. he was you know really like in real life. So it was more of he was he was prevent presenting what the college saw as negative to be more of as a defense mechanism for his neighborhood mm -hmm. as opposed to where he was really trying to get to in school. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not saying right, wrong, or otherwise, it's just it can get very complicated very quickly. It can. Well, and that's the interesting thing about your online presence and, and why it's important to think about it because it's working for you 24-7. I mean, you're in bed, you're at work, you're at school, and it is still working for you. I mean, one of the things to remember that the stuff you're doing late at night and you're posting online, it doesn't matter if it's Twitter or Facebook or any other social network, um, that's going to be, you know, breaking news to people in other parts of the country. So if you're looking to move elsewhere or you're looking to build connections um, in a very global economy, um, you really need to pay attention to that, you know. And if you're, if you're trying to, you know, make friends in the neighborhood, but you've got people outside the neighborhood who are looking to hire you or, you know, um, let you into school, that can make a difference. Now this stat here 
is probably higher now, but 15% of law schools and 14% of medical schools screen applicants' social profiles. Um, and that's kind of scary. I mean, that's getting into grad school. That's when you finally know what you want to do with yourself when you grow up, so to speak. And that makes a difference. I mean, you know, you put a lot of time and effort into undergrad, and then you can blow it by what you've posted online. So that's kind of something to be aware of. Uh, like I said, I really like this infograph. There's a lot of data on here. There's a ton of it. So please take a look at it and, and see what's out there. So let's go back. Do we have any questions, or can we move on? Mm, not yet. Nope. All right. Do you have any questions? Type them in. Wait. I just did. Nope. Sorry. I lied. <laughs> um, <laughs> the digital you matters for sports, too, at all levels of competition. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, really, it's technology is part of our life. I have some, um, some dates that uh, I find of interest, but um, the iPhone, and this is one of those, like, when you're talking to people, you know, raise your hand if you have an iPhone, and, like, all the hands in the room go up. Um, the iPhone Not came out in, yeah, 2007, and think of how incorporated it is into people's lives. I mean, they take it to bed, they get to the bathroom, it goes to school with you, to church with you, shopping with you. I mean, that is part of so many people's life. It's always there. So, you know, this isn't going to be going away. We're, we have technology for the long run. So, okay, so then what exactly is online presence? And, you know, we've talked about what, you know, digital footprint kind of is and what online presence is and what does that mean. Well, according to Wikipedia, and I do like Wikipedia, it defines um, managing online presence as presenting and drawing traffic to personal or professional brand online, the collective online existence of a person or a business. And the reason I like to use that definition, for one, is it really gives us a good idea of what you're doing. You're presenting and you're drawing traffic to your brand, and, and you are a brand whether you realize it or not. And it's also the collective online existence of a person. So this is you online, and while we're all here in this physical world doing something like the radio show right now or, you know, listening elsewhere, uh, your online presence is working for you. And if you have a LinkedIn profile, you, you get a pretty uh, good sense of that because, you know, it'll flag it and say, like, hey, these people have looked at your profile. And you're like, oh, boy, people are actually looking at my profile. It'll tell you, your profile um, came up in this search with all these other people. So, you know, doing those keywords and adding to your skills really does make a difference, but it, it's kind of creepy at the same time to know that, you know, who are these people and they're looking at my yeah, profile. Sometimes I wonder, why are you looking at my yes, profile? Yes, <laughs> but, yes. but it could be, you know, a blog post I posted to my yep. LinkedIn profile. They're like, oh, that was interesting. Who is this person? Yep. Even though they have nothing to do with libraries mm -hmm. or, or anything. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so. Yep, and that, well, that's the kind of the hand-in-hand -hand with the online presence is the, the reputation management. Since your online presence is working for you 24-7, you need to own it and you need to maintain that reputation because if you don't, somebody else is. And and I don't think that's a, you know, a, a bold thing to say. We all know that. I mean, people are talking about us, um, whether we realize it or not. You know, what is it, your nose itches or your ear itches, somebody's talking about you. Um, and so the same thing is happening online. People are, are looking for information about you. They know you from a presentation or where you work. They're curious about, like you said, a blog post you posted or if you're using Twitter, if they want to know more, you're going to check out your profile and that kind of thing. So. You know, this is the, the private versus the public or the personal versus the professional. Uh, one of the reasons why I want to do the, the personal versus the professional is, you know, here when we meet people, you say, who are you? You know, hi, I'm Marcia Doherty Baker. You know, oh, what do you do? I mean, that's like the first thing you ask somebody, what do you do? Um, and so that really defines who you are and what you do. So I want to talk about that first. Um, you, the professional, and what you're going to find online. Well, professionally, I'm a librarian. You're going to see that. That's kind of the big you know, keyword or the hashtag you put with my name. And so you're going to find my profile on LinkedIn, on my faculty page. You're going to find it on the service work I do, the committees I belong to, the memberships. So ALA, NLA, Nebraska Library Association, MPLA, um, and then Law Library World, you've got MAL and AALL. So I'm there on those websites and those um, circles as well. That kind of defines me as a professional. Now, for other people, it's going to be library, but then maybe you were a teacher, or maybe you migrated from IT to library, or, you know, the case of where I work, you know, maybe they were a lawyer and then they became a librarian. So it's going to be different for everybody, but you kind of need to think who you are. Now, the reason I use this picture is, do you remember the first time you were at the grocery store as a kid and you saw your teacher in the store, and you were like, whoa, Miss So-and-so doesn't live at the school? And it's a shocker, right? You're like, oh my goodness, they're actually here. Well, that's kind of how it is online, you know? You look at someone and you're like, whoa, I didn't know they were involved. 
with that. And, and it kind of changes your appearance or your perception of them just by seeing everything that they are attached to. So when you look at yourself, you, the person, the private person, you know, what comes up? What are, where are you at? What areas do you occupy? For many people, it's Facebook. I think pretty much everybody's on Facebook except for my mom. And she just uses my Facebook to stalk everybody else. So <laughs> there's that. Twitter. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about, you know, Twitter and blogs and that kind of thing, I am, use Twitter all the time. I'm on it. But you're not going to find me, Marcia Doherty Baker, on Twitter because I manage my library's Twitter feed. So I'm using it quite a bit, following a lot of people, but it's not me. So that's one thing to think about, that gray area that you occupy. Um, but blogs, are you using, you know, WordPress? Are you using, you know, stuff like Tumblr? Are you using Pinterest, Instagram, that kind of thing? And then your religious affiliations and your service groups that you are, you know, your church or, you know, maybe your rotary, that kind of thing, you know, those places that you might be. And then hobbies. There's a lot of hobby groups that have active online presence. And um, anytime you've had to make a username and password for something, you have an online profile. <laughs> so it's, there's the ability there to see what's going on. So where th this is always the big question that I like to ask during these sessions. And, and I'll preface it with, you know, the last year or so, I've really thought about it from my perspective in that I have my blog. Yes, I post professional stuff. Yes, I post personal stuff. Most of that stuff automatically gets cross-posted mm -hmm. to Twitter and Facebook mm -hmm. or whatever. But then, you know, if I'm posting a Muppet video that has pretty much absolutely nothing to do with libraries, I yeah. uncheck the box that says send it to LinkedIn because yeah. I kind of say let's just try to keep just the professional stuff to LinkedIn, mm -hmm. though sometimes the Muppet videos will sneak in because I forget to uncheck the box. But I, I don't try to delineate too much mm -hmm. between, you know, my outside of work life and my work life. I, I've kind of amalgamated it, mm -hmm. and people will question me about that. I'll say, but, yeah, but you aren't aware of all this stuff in my personal life. I don't put online. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, so there, there is more to me than you see, but I am generally living in public. Mm -hmm. You online seem to be very, like, I'm sticking to the professional stuff. Yeah. Do, do you have a personal – have you separated it, or you just said online I'm going to be just professional, and, and that's, that's where I am? Or do you – because I know people who try to run two, two separate, separate lives separate. online, mm -hmm. and I, I can't believe how, I don't know how it's hard. It's hard, yeah. <laughs> no, I, and I it's a hell of a lot of work to go yeah. into that. Um, I, I would say I haven't, like, made a, a firm and solid one, like, I'm going to do this and not that. I just feel like, professionally, I do enough online that when it comes to me, the person, there's just some stuff I'm like, dude, I'm tired. I'm already doing all this stuff all day. I don't feel like uh, adding more. Okay. And, and so it's not that I'm, you know worried about anything or you know I, I don't want to participate I would just say I've I've chosen to do a few things and just do them really well and okay. run them out as long as I can now on Facebook that's where you'd see more of a cross between the professional and the private okay. um, now with LinkedIn um, that's where I'm I'm definitely professional that's where when students want to connect with me and I tell all the people I supervise you know I will not be friends with you on Facebook if I'm signing your timesheet if I'm hiring you I'm not going to friend you on Facebook, oh, okay. and I won't accept friend requests, but I will connect with you on LinkedIn, because that implies that I would recommend you for a job, and as your supervisor, I feel that that's completely appropriate okay. to do, right. and I've, I've written the recommendations for people on, on LinkedIn and that kind of thing, so that's, I guess that would be the place where I definitely am always professional and try and connect within my field to the other people. Um, Facebook, yeah, you know, I've tried, and I think that's just one where, you know, usually what happens, and I think everybody does this with Facebook, you... you probably you're accepting a lot of friend requests, then all of a sudden you look at your number and you're like, eh, and you go in and you probably clean it up a little bit, yeah. you know, and, and I think that's really normal. I'm, I'm and most due for people, one of those. <laughs> yeah, most people are okay with that, you know, uh, but that's a good question. I mean, I've had faculty ask, you know, listen, I have, I'm getting friends requests from students, you know, how do you, what do you do? And mm -hmm. I know some faculty will actually, you know, put it in their syllabus, you know, I won't friend people on Facebook, so I'm just flat out stated as a policy. Um, I, you know, especially in law school, I think it's appropriate to say, you know, LinkedIn is the place to be to make that connection because if that professor would give a recommendation to that student for a clerkship or a mm -hmm. job, it seems entirely appropriate to connect with them on LinkedIn. And at the same time, they're only going to be in law school for three years and then they're moving on. So you're building your connections, right. which is always a good thing. But yeah, that's that really weird gray area. And I think everybody has to make that choice, which why you need to know about online presence. I mean, if you right. don't know what's out there, you don't know how to draw the lines and what to do. Mm -hmm. So, but like, some of it's just a time suckage. I mean, I oh, yeah. oh, yeah. don't <laughs> I just know I'd be on the computer all the time, which which would be fun, but, you know, yeah, you have to set some boundaries on sure. it. Sure. 
So, all right. Well, I hope everybody can see this. This is one of my favorite movies. If you haven't seen Office Space, you need to watch it. It's old, but it's good. So uh, the boss, for those of you who haven't seen it, is just a jerk and is always wanting extra from his employees. And he says, you know, he spent the last 20 minutes checking Facebook and Twitter. And, of course, the employee is like, yeah, but you missed the hour I spent updating my resume on LinkedIn. The reason I like this is the fact that both of them know they're online and they're not doing work. And I think that's pretty obvious. And any boss who thinks everybody's only doing work at line, online or only doing work when they're at work, I mean, look at March Madness. Productivity is probably <laughs> down, but it's really building it's camaraderie. It, except the for the state you know? where they have completely they block, blocked they anything block vaguely every, related to here sports. Here in Nebraska, period. if you're a state worker, every year in March you get an email telling wow. you that all sports-related sites with streaming anything are blocked. Until in fact, it's over. some without streaming, just because you mm. might check scores. <laughs> I mean, it's wow. Just well, you know, and I've had to have this conversation with my students. I'm like, you know, you're at this, you're working, you need to be working, and that doesn't mean you can watch streaming video. Um, but what I like about this is the fact that everybody knows we're all doing stuff online. The employee, though, what's important to him is the fact he's updating his skills. Um, you know, bosses seem to think that everybody's just goofing around, but the fact of the matter is, all of these different social networks really improve our relationship with our coworkers and our friends and they make us a better employee in the long run. The productivity is going to be there because you're becoming aware of what's going on. You're paying attention to things online. Uh, there's so much stuff I get from Twitter that I use all the time. I mean that's the first place I go for news anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not CNN. It's, it's Twitter. Well, um, and for me in this case my boss if someone's supervisor said that to me I'd be like yeah I know I, I run and m monitor three or four pages on Facebook that are related to the library commissions and we have three Twitter accounts in the Library Commission, so yes, yeah, it was. three, yeah. Um, right. Oh, and I agree so, with you. I mean, yeah, that's I the mean, same thing when they're like, but you're right on Facebook in, all the time. You're going to be seeing personal things as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm like, I manage my library's Facebook page and, mm -hmm. and our Twitter page and a couple other things, and, and yeah. So don't mm -hmm. harp on me for being on social media when that's my job. That's yes. what you hired right. me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on. Now. And I might find somebody for the show. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Did you have a question that came in? Did you, Right before you switch to this, yeah. about, about LinkedIn. Um, and this would actually, I think, apply to any social network, and I guess it's going to vary. Should you accept invitations on LinkedIn to connect with people you don't know and have never met? <sighs> I get them all the time. Yeah. And that, then, Go ahead. I don't know. Um, we may all we'll have different three, answers. Three it's different answers here, yeah. It's going to depend. I get, I get requests for, on LinkedIn and Facebook and other places from lots of people that I don't know and never heard of. And I do the library anything, and I research them. Yeah. I see who is this. Mm -hmm. are, is there a reason they're contacting me? Like, are they a librarian at so and so library in Kansas, and I've just never heard of them? Mm -hmm. Then maybe I'll say, Yeah, you're a, you're a, you're a colleague in my field. Mm -hmm. Just because I've never heard of you doesn't mean that's a bad thing. You've obviously heard of me somehow. Yeah. I, or found me somewhere. Mm -hmm. So sure. Um, if they're just some random person, I don't have a clue and can't figure out why they sent it to me. Then no, I just decline it. Because mm -hmm. um, I can't tell why you're contacting me. I don't see anything in your profile that explains this. There are cases, and there's people out there, and I think you're talking about how you have so many friends, friend collectors yes. mm -hmm. <laughs> on all yes. these social networks that just will try and friend anyone and don't care who you are, and you don't care who they are, and I just don't like that kind of thing. And there's also creepy people out there. That's a whole other issue. <laughs> um, stalker type people. Yeah. So that's what I do. I agree with you. I, I feel the same way. I mean... And I know this as a person who's newer to the field. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't have a JD, but I work in a law library. Um, that building those connections for me is really important. So the, the techie people, the, the people that do the same things as me, I've really tried to build those connections to, to learn more and to get to know people. And so I will put in friends' requests. If I work with somebody on a project, I'll put in a, a LinkedIn request to connect with them. Um, the only time I would do that on Facebook is if that's the only way we can connect for a conference presentation or mm -hmm. something, you know, yeah. but um, for the most part, I use LinkedIn for my professional mm -hmm. connections. Um, there are people, though, that I'm like, what? Who are you? Yeah. And I agree, you know, you search them and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. I think it's similar, I just thought of, of when it, it's networking mm -hmm. um, that you've always done for years and years, and in the past, you may have met strangers at meetings or conferences and exchanged business cards. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, but you're doing it now online. 
Now, have yeah. you had the person go, I'm going to send you a request, don't freak out, I'm not a stalker? I've had that at conferences. I, yeah, I have that. I, yeah, I've had that at conferences. I, like, you know, every, you know, I have a common name. A lot of people have my name. I'm going to, you know, send you a request. It is me, yeah. yeah I, I, it, I'd say it varies. On Facebook, because if I friend them back, I'm going to get what they're posting in their news feed. Yeah. I tend to be a little more picky, but I don't necessarily have to know them. Yeah. On LinkedIn, I started out with, I need to know you. You are my professional network. Yeah. But then when I started feeding my blog into LinkedIn, mm -hmm. I started getting more people I don't know oddball because yeah. people would see my post and go, oh, maybe I want to, you know, can I? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's the obvious spam. Yeah. Um, I'll admit as male, the creep factor is usually less of an issue. <laughs> um, you know, it perfectly, it's a valid issue, just less from, from my perspective. Um, and... Uh, you know, if you tend to be libraries, sure. Because in LinkedIn, I guess, you know, that I don't necessarily suddenly start getting a flood of what they're yeah. posting. Mm -hmm. um, and I've gotten some weird ones. I'll, oh, I'll get the, the you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm a self-published author. Oh, you're a librarian. I'm like, yeah, no, ignore. Yeah. Um, but um, so it I mostly it, it get varies. a lot of Twitter following, um, which I don't care. You can follow me. I yeah, yeah, really right. want from authors. Yeah, oh, okay. I get that um, too. Authors, I think a lot of them are just seeing the word librarian right. and figure, oh, yay, you'll you'll buy my book. You'll get my book in your library. Yeah. And I never follow yeah. any of them back. They're happy to follow me if they want to. Mm -hmm. If I read them, I'll get what them they them yeah. But um, that seems to be a thing that they are trying to uh, connect with libraries by following anyone yeah. that has the word librarian in there. And profile. in some cases from LinkedIn, I've gotten speaking gigs. So, yeah. you know, I, I do kind of... You know, I have a, a secondary potential reason to, mm -hmm. to make those connections. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and I think it goes back to who you are or where you are in your professional world. You know, for my students that when they ask me questions like this, you know, they're new. I mean, they're, they've been undergraduates. They might not have a work experience. They're looking to find a, a job or to clerk and that kind of thing. So they're really about building a network because it's who you know and, and how you can kind of say, yeah, you know, I'll recommend this person. They worked for me. Um, even if they're a student worker at the library, you know, so that's going to be a little bit different. But if you've been in the field as a professional for a while, I think you can be maybe a little bit more picky over who you're going to connect with on some of these things because you know, okay, here's where I want my career to go or here's the people I want to connect with or work with or where I want to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and being a little bit more proactive and accepting those or and asking for connections, that really helps, you know, because once again, it's about you, the person. I mean, even though we have all this technology that lets us engage and communicate with each other, it still comes back to you, the person. Um, that's going to have to do all the work. And so you need to make sure it is working for you. One of the things I'd say for kind of best practices on how to handle, you know, managing your online presence is um, the first thing I tell my students, pick a name. Uh, you know, whatever name is on your diploma, if that's a professional name, you're going to go by it, then that's what you use for those professional ones. For your student profiles, uh, for your resume, most people still have a, a print resume, and that's a good place to start because you can collect all the data that's on you. Um, online profile, that kind of thing, use it. You know, And I do have students who get concerned because they're like, listen, I Googled my name, like you said, and there's people with a record, and that's not me, and I need to get a job, and what do I do? And you know, That's why I say, well, use the name you were given at birth. I mean, my goodness, if that's you, if that's on all of your hiring documents, because I'm somebody who hires and I have to look at you know, social security card and passport and that kind of stuff. If that's the, the, the you that you're going to be as a professional, start using that name and start building that online profile as a professional. Mm -hmm. that, that poor Michael Sowers, the professional soccer player, really <laughs> does not come up nearly as much as I do unless you add soccer. <laughs> you know, and then also the, the appropriate profile picture. I mean, I use my faculty picture that I have on my, my LinkedIn profile and any of my professional stuff because consistency. For one, yeah, it's a headshot. It's consistent. That's kind of my professional brand. And then I use something different for Facebook and the other stuff because me as the person, you know, the private person is different than the professional one. But, you know, get a decent headshot and use it and use that for everything. And when you change one, then you change all of those other professional profiles. Um, I heard a communication speaker and she said she does it once a year or every other year, whenever they have to do new headshots, sure. that's when she goes through and she changes the, all of her profiles to match that headshot. And do you, 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 you keep saying headshot. You advocate not picking a flower or... I hate that. I, <laughs> I absolutely hate it when people have a, a professional profile picture and it's a puppy or a flower or a landscape. I'm like, seriously, dude, how? Or their kid. Or their kid. I mean, come on, be a professional. If you're going to be walking into my library and I have to greet you for an interview and I don't know how you 
what you, what look, you like. look like. It's really mm -hmm. hard because you're not giving me, I mean, and I'm not saying, you know, we have to, to see everybody before we talk to them, but it's really hard for me to greet you and make you feel welcome in my library as a speaker or as a guest or as a, a, a candidate if I don't know what you look like. Mm -hmm. And I just know you're going to show up at some point in time. So, yes, professionally, I would say, and you know what? Also, make sure it's a current picture. I cannot tell you how many people I have met that I'm looking at a picture from 15 years ago. And that's not cool. So, mm -hmm. you know what? If you're the professional, do that. And then I would say define yourself. Start writing your mission or your bio or your introduction. You know, a lot of people, as you speak, they'll say, you know, do you have an introduction? Mm -hmm. Can I have your introduction, please? Um, and start writing that now. And it can be key, key words, like I said, or hashtags or whatever you want to use to define yourself. But start doing that because that's going to help you. And the best way to write a, a bio is when people say, you know, who are you and what do you do, just start getting that down on paper and start listing that so that you have it there. But also highlight your skills. It's one thing to say you're a librarian, but, you know, my title is Access Services Librarian. What does that mean? <laughs> it depends upon where you are. In a law library, it's different than an academic library. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that exactly mean? And so then I need to sit down and define what that is. So. And then the next thing would be connecting with the professionals in your field, like we said, network. And, you know, that could be LinkedIn if you need to build that network. It could be following people on Twitter and retweeting them. Um, it could be, you know, making sure you have an up-to-date uh, profile on a professional network, that kind of thing. Um, but definitely do that. I know for um, AAWL, the American Association of Law Libraries, we, you know, you can log into the website and create your profile. I did because I figured people are going to be there and they're going to be looking at me. And I put in my professional headshot. <laughs> Not a puppy. Um, and, you know, you put that stuff in there so that people can find you. Because, honestly, I would be more suspicious if I was looking for somebody I didn't find anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we kind of wonder, days. like, yeah, yeah ooh, what's going on? There's nothing about this person that's kind of creepy. You know, I mean, I'd rather find questionable stuff than nothing. So, you know, that's the other thing to think about. Um, it's kind of like having credit. You know, better maybe bad credit than no credit, so to speak. Um, and then think about what sites. I know people talk about the big three, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. I would also add Google Plus on there. Yep. And then if you're an artist or a designer, you need to think about doing Pinterest or Instagram. Um, a lot of people are using those to showcase their design. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, maybe even WordPress and customize what you can do for people. I, I'm, I'm a big advocate then of the centralize a location for yourself yeah. and then feed out from there yeah um, I mean you know I've, I've had my domain for well over a decade now um, and had websites before that but it's probably 90% of what I post online goes there first and then mm -hmm. feeds out and then you know that improves the Google juice and it, and, mm -hmm. and it pulls it all back and then I'm not creating 10 years worth of content on somebody else's website that goes poof tomorrow mm -hmm. and all that content's gone. Now, mm -hmm. some of that content could go away yeah. and some of the content I posted 10 years ago on my own website is severely wrong and out of date, but it was right at the time, mm -hmm. but it's somewhere I control. You control. Yeah, and that's a good point. I mean, we're still living in the wild, wild west of the internet. I mean, you know, we said iPhones have only been around since 07, but Facebook came out 10 years ago in, 20, in 2004. Mm -hmm. So think about all the content that Facebook now owns because anytime you post something, it's theirs. Versus, you know, you've had your website for 10 years. You own all the content that's on your website. So that's something to think about as you, as you mm -hmm. do think about where I want to be online. You know, what can you own? What belongs to you versus what are you giving other people access to? LinkedIn and MySpace came out in 2003. MySpace is pretty much gone, but LinkedIn is now. Still there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's still there, but <laughs> MySpace changed. is not some place I would yeah. go to look for, you know, for yeah. job connections, that kind of thing. But LinkedIn is banned. Banned, yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, two in five employers uh, screen candidates via social media, and 65% use social networks to, to um, screen for professionalism. That's what they're looking for. So. Let me show you this here. Um, Michael emailed this to me a couple week or two ago. And uh, the rise of social media and pre-employment candidate screening, statistics and trends. It's kind of a scary topic and headline. Um, but the fact is, take a look at this, especially um, library science students who are looking to get a job in undergrads. Um, because people are looking at you online. And I think for a while there, you know, most people assume that, you know, old people don't know how to use the internet, so nobody's going to find it. Well, you know, we all know how to use privacy settings and find stuff because we're librarians. So, I mean, it's like stump the librarian. It's kind of hard to do anymore.
you're going to find it. But, you know, two in five employers use social media to screen candidates. Um, and this is Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So what you're posting there is always going to be available. I know that's happened to me. Mm -hmm. I, you know, mm -hmm. just, it, I wasn't even job hunting. <laughs> so. You know, and look at this one, culture. I mean, with, there's the whole likability factor. Just because somebody is qualified to do the job doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to fit into the environment. So that, you know, they're taking a look at this. A uh, lot of good data on this one. I highly recommend it, especially to, you know, people who are looking to build their online presence and, and really be a professional. But, you know, also if you're hiring, you know, this is true. And you can see that you're not the only one, I guess, you know, would be the way to look at that. So... All right, so moving on. So um, we are all in this together. If any of you ever watch Red Green, the Red Green show from Canada on public TV, you're going to recognize mm -hmm. that. Um, it's really true. As librarians, you know, this is our job. We need to know how to find information and how to use information, and that includes being aware of what's out there. Uh, one of the things that's been interesting about my job in, in the law library is I, I do a lot of uh, technology for lawyers and that kind of thing. And, and the, the ethics and the qualifications have changed. And one of the things that's now expected of all lawyers is that they are aware of what's going on with technology and that they know how to use it. Wow. And I think as librarians, that is something that we've probably always done, but we need to be reminded. Um, our job is to find information and know how to use information. And that means in any format that's out there. So one of the reasons why I like this old uh, World War II poster, loose lips, loose lips might sink ships, is that's true. You know, I would say loose posts are going to sink your job <laughs> kind of thing. Um, you really need to be aware of what's out there, what you're posting, and then know how to talk to the people you work with and your students and, and your users as they come in about what's happening. I'm not saying that we need to jump up on a soapbox and, you know, and, and shout all of this stuff, but... This really is part of being a good librarian, is knowing what's out there and how to use it. Uh, and if you don't maintain your own online presence, it's really hard to help others. It's kind of like that walk the walk thing. So you need to know what's going on out there. You need to know how to handle your Facebook privacy settings so you can show other people too. You really need to have a LinkedIn profile, especially if you're in academics, because your students and your faculty and the people you come in contact with, they've been told they need to have a LinkedIn profile. And they're going to come to you because you're the librarian and you know how to do this thing. So there's an expectation there of who we are uh, as, as professionals. Um, but everything happens in real time. And I think that's probably the biggest change that we've had in the last couple of years is, you know, when you hit post or submit or upload or whatever, it happens in real time. People are seeing it, and you can't take that back. Um, it's going to be on somebody's server, and hopefully you can ask them to remove it and that kind of thing. But it's always going to be out there and searchable. So it's really important to... to um, Think about, you know, if this is something that you would talk about in the office, then it's probably okay to post. You know, like you said, you, Michael, you've kind of, you know, merged your online self as your professional and your your personal self. But, you know, for some people, that's a good filter. I have a coworker that that's what she says. You know, if I would talk about it in my office, then I'm okay posting it. And, you know, that might be the way to take a look at it. Um, and, we, and we do talk about the Muppets around here sometimes. Yeah, so, you know. You know. <laughs> yeah, we talk about movies. Yeah, staff meetings, we talk about movies and that kind of thing. So... Um, but it's important to think about that because you're a direct reflection. Your online self is a direct reflection of you, the personal self. And, you know, I think my mom or somebody when I was a kid told me, you know, even dirty windows will reflect light. And it's very true. I mean, it doesn't matter really who you are and what your online profile is. It is reflecting on you. So, you know, I would suggest, you know, focus on a few and do it really well. Get started. Know what you're doing. And then be aware of what else is out there because there's so many things. And, you know, you need to keep track of that. Um... I have resources for people, a lot of good stuff. I would like to highlight the TED Talk, if you have time, your online life, permanent as a tattoo. That is an excellent TED Talk. Um, basically, your online presence is like a tattoo, and even if you want to remove it, it's going to be painful. Hmm. And then some of these other ones that are out here are really good resources, depending upon what you're doing. Um, you know, you really, we don't have the, the paper resumes and CVs anymore. Your online presence becomes your social resume. That's there. Building your online brand, you are a brand whether you realize it or not. Uh, managing your online reputation. And then there's a really good one out there by the Outreach Library, Don't Get Fired or Sued. 
Um, that's good. And then the infographics that I showed are also there. Do you want to take a look at those? All these links will be added to the delicious links that we put together for the show every week. So don't try and scribble them all down now. You don't have to. We'll get them out there for you. <laughs> there was, I, was, I just saw a Facebook post that was like, okay, do I really need to buy really nice paper to print out my resume on anymore? Oh. You know, I mean, like, because, and, and it was like librarians in the job market, and they're like, nobody, everybody wants it electronically anyways. You know, so you do buy that really nice resume paper, the cream colored linen the stuff, you know. Stuff, yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, most people are like, eh, backup. Yeah. But chances are you won't need it. Oh, Don't we, buy a yeah, lot. Yeah, we post CVs on the mm -hmm. Tackley web pages. They're just PDFs. I mean, you just right. post them there. And if people really want to print it, they can. Mm-hmm. Um, the only other, and, and please, if you've got more questions, uh, send them in. I, I, I've been kind of asking mine as, as we go through mm -hmm. here. Um, the other one, and, and this is going to be our, our book thing for those of us, the, those uh, in Nebraska who participate in their Learning 2.0 program for uh, April. It is now March, so yes. April's book thing is going to be It's Complicated by Dana Boyd. Have you read that yet? Uh, Are you familiar with Dana Boyd? I am. Yes, I her book is out. Okay. Uh, it's about the, the, the social the, the, the social life of network teens. And she's been working with teens yeah, for the last dozen of years. That is yep. a good book. Um, and I've started reading it. You can get it free on our website or you can buy it uh, okay. um, uh, online. Um, and it's taking what you talked about with what we should be telling teens. It's what teens are doing and what these teens actually think about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, I'm, her point is, is that they're probably a lot more aware of the privacy issues and things that we think they are mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, her, her other thing is that, you know, we're, we're looking at all these things they do online, and one of her central points is, is that's because we don't let them go to the mall and play outside anymore. Mm -hmm. So they're doing what we did in the mall and interacting with people one way and, and in semi-private, they're now doing it online. Um, but uh, interesting book. Well, kid, kids, that. no, no, because younger kids' lives have been so structured and filled mm -hmm. and were, you know, overall aware of dangers. I'm not saying they never get allowed to go to the mall, but malls are putting in curfews, and you can't be in the mall unless you're under 18 with, without a parent, things like mm -hmm. that, whereas, you know, in the 80s when we hung out in the mall, it was just nobody cared. But anyways, I overgeneralization, it's a 200-page book I'm trying to summarize in 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, um, so, but anyways, a very, very interesting read. I'm, I'm part of the way through it myself now. Cool. Well, a book I did a, a book review for is that one by Dan Schwabel up there, Why Online Presence Will Replace Your Resume. Hmm. And uh, he did a, a new book, and I highly recommend it to anybody to read. I mean, I think he's really doing this for Gen Y. It's Gen Y career and workplace advice and that kind of thing. Uh, but it was really good for me to read. You know, I'm Gen X. Just mm -hmm. to, to be aware of what's going on and why all of this is important. But to better understand the people I'm going to be supervising and I work with. Yeah. But I would recommend that because it's it basically called Promote Yourself. And the whole book is about how you become a good candidate, what you need to do. So I would recommend that kind of thing as well just to be aware of. And then there's one out there called LOL. And it's a, it's a book by a young man who got in trouble for building um, – Oh, website. It was kind of an online bullying website, not like a Chris Hilton or anything, but uh -huh. it's kind of something like that. And part of his penance, so to speak, was to write this book about being a good digital citizen. Hmm, okay. And so I'll get the, the link to that one as well. It's it's a good read talking about who we are as people and who we're going to be online. Right. So. Let me try taking this from a completely different point of view because yeah. I mean, I you know, obviously I'm I'm an outlier in that you know I'm looking for speaking gigs and. You know, maybe next week if the right job came along, I would, you know, consider changing even though I'm, you know, I'm perfectly comfortable and happy here. You know, I'm 50-something librarian. I've, I've been at the library for 20, 30 years. I'm, I'm perfectly happy there. And, yeah, I have a Facebook account. Is that how, how much of this, oh, okay, uh, uh, how much of this do I really need to care about? I would say, you, and I think you bring up a really good point, and, I'm going to step out and say you need to care about it a lot because another okay. one of the areas of my research is digital assets after death. And basically mm. the idea of that once you die, your online presence goes on living. And anybody who's lost family, close friends, and that kind of thing, you still see their Facebook profile, and you're still friends with them, and they still follow you on Twitter and that kind of thing. It, it's kind of awkward, and it's very, yes, that's it. 
and it's very weird. And so I would suggest that it is going to matter because some of the things that you have done online, people aren't going to know about. Um, and anytime you have created a username and a password and you have an account, somebody's going to have to deal with that. And that's not just social media. That's not going to be Facebook and mm -hmm. your website, LinkedIn. Now, your website's a good example of why people need to be aware because if you're getting ad revenue. I don't know if that's an option. Not, not at the moment. Okay, but, you know. but that's something that comes up if you if you have a website that's generating ads, uh, ad revenue. But online banking, um, if mm -hmm. you have an Amazon account, if you have an eBay account where you're making money, you're doing e-commerce, that kind of thing. People need to take care of that. Uh, family, next of kin, can get in trouble for getting into your online accounts to try and close them out because most social media sites will expire when the person dies. We're not at the point, though, where a death certificate triggers those void, but people are still accessing them. They're still getting in to do things. They might not have been memorialized, but you can um, have serious charges against people who are trying to help out when somebody has died because they're accessing Internet um, websites when they're not supposed to. That's unauthorized. Huh, okay. So yeah. that becomes a bigger deal where you say, no, this, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to be dead and gone, big deal, but think about Amazon or think about Netflix. I mean, who pays your Netflix bill and your family mm -hmm. wants to get on and they want to change the username and password and Netflix is going to say, no, only the person that created this account can do that. Right. Well, two weeks ago we had Jasmine on and talking about passwords and security and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And we kind of got into the conversation of, you know, who has access to your passwords? How do you pass along your passwords mm -hmm. when you die? And mm -hmm. Google has an option of, you know, if I haven't logged in, it will automatically yep. check with me and send an email or I suggested, you know, um, as I think Cory Doctor has suggested, you know, split your password, your master password in half, mm -hmm. half to your lawyer, half to your your mm -hmm. spouse or whatever, and then that way if you die, they, but, but now you're saying, so then if, 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 if my wife then has my password after my death and tries to go in to shut the account down, she could get in trouble, she potentially. Oh, and wow. I think those are cases where then what you do before you try and do that, contact the website itself, contact you outside of the account, contact Facebook somehow, and it's because there's lots of cases out there, stories of someone died and we're trying to do something with their account, right. their families, and they're mm -hmm. having problems or not. They want to shut it down, or they want to make it be memorialized, and Facebook will do that. They will freeze an account mm -hmm. in right. as a memorial to a person. Mm -hmm. With those recent, the 10-year um, videos that Facebook yep. did for people, they, yep. they, the first they were if you about it, they said, oh, yes, for dead people, people have passed on, we will create one of those for them, for, for the family. Right. So yeah. from outside of the account, contact that company yeah. separately sure. and find out what do I do now that so and so, my husband, my wife, whatever, well, has passed on, and they, I'm, they by now would have well, some sort of well, information. Here, 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 most okay. of those, most of those cases I've heard though, the family didn't know the password. Didn't know the password. You know, right. the, well, yeah, the one yeah, that started so. it all was back in 2004. There was a young man. Um, he was serving in Middle East, and he was killed in action. And he and his father had corresponded via email, much like correspondence has been, you know, between family and sons at war for a long time. And his dad wanted to finish this uh, memorial to his son by getting the emails from Yahoo so that they could um, create this memorial. And he didn't know his son's password to get in the email account, contacted Yahoo, and Yahoo said, no, you can't get in. The user is dead. Nobody else can access the account. That's in the fine print, the terms of agreement, right, yeah. that kind of thing that he checked on. The only person who can access this account is the user. When the user is dead, the account is inactive, right? So it actually went to court. And finally, Yahoo released uh, all of the outgoing messages to this, man, this man's son had sent, but none of the received with the understanding that, well, if somebody sent him something, they might not want anybody to know. Right, yeah. And so that was back in 2004. So we've had mm -hmm. a good 10 years of people dying online. And I think the last stats mm -hmm. were like, you know, there's hundreds of people that die every day that have Facebook profiles. Um, you know, how do we handle this? This is a growing issue. Not only do we have little kids who have an online presence before they're born, we have people who are dying and they have 20 years of online presence yeah. that we need to work through. Mm -hmm. yeah, and as it continues, it's going to be greater. But, you know, anytime Something that needs to be figured out. Yeah. Something needs to be figured out because if you have created a username and a password, if you have a credit card number attached to it, you have a digital footprint, whether right. you realize yeah. it or not. Which, which wins, my will or, or, you know, will and testament and, or, or their terms of service. Mm -hmm. You know, and it is. It, I mean, it's it's scary, and there's a lot of like I said, this is a you know, research area I've had for a couple of years because there's a lot of people going, well, what do we do? I mean, if you're estate planning, how do you handle? It? And everybody's told change your passwords mm -hmm. all the time, so you're mm -hmm. constantly updating the passwords. How many free services do you join just to try and play? 
Oh, most yeah. of those don't matter. But you know, you think about bill pay. Right. You think about uh, anything that's generating money, anything that's tied to a credit card. And honestly, if anybody has stuff that they don't want their family to see, delete it now. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to go through files and find stuff and be like, whoa. It's another thing to get bills on and be like, I did not know that they subscribed to this particular website or that kind yeah. of thing. You know, so there's a lot of stuff that I think you know, we assume that everything we do online is anonymous. That's not the case. No. Username yeah. and password and credit card and you can be tracked. Wow. So yeah, it's, yeah bring it's the lawyers thing. into the room and it gets more complicated immediately. <laughs> <laughs> it gets more interesting. Yeah, I tell oh, you. Oh, definitely. Yeah. We do have so, a couple sure. of last minute questions yeah. that came in here. Um it's a combo question, but it's really two separate things. I think we did mention this already, um, and so I'll do the second part first. Um, what do employers think about when they bring up your name online and it's someone who's definitely not you? I mean and we talked about before, mm -hmm. get yourself a presence out there so that if they do find something that is someone who's been arrested or done something, you can say, no, see, that's not me. This is mm -hmm. me over here. Mm -hmm. There are people, because this person says, there's at least one other person with my exact name, and I can't really have a different name. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to come up, and I would hope by now employers understand that that happens. <laughs> I mean, I do a search for myself and look in images, and there's tons of other photos that are not of me, yeah. but there are the pictures that are me that are connected to me and my professional accounts, mm -hmm. and hopefully an employer would be able to figure that out, yeah. that, oh, this is that person, this other girl is this person, not the one that I'm talking to. Yeah. I, I, would, I would hope that most employers would realize that you're going to do a location search along with that person. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, More if, than just if name. your name is Joe Smith, you'd want to look for Joe Smith in Lincoln, Nebraska, right? Yeah. And, and, I mean, they should have that from your application where you currently live. Mm -hmm. And they're also yeah. going to have the other jobs that you've had. So it would be easy to do a Joe Smith, Lincoln, Nebraska, Joe Smith, you know, please not New York City or something. But they and, should and be narrow, able to narrow that, it down. Narrow yeah. that down. And if they can't, you know, you kind of say, well, I mean, if my employer, if this potential employer can't figure out that, <laughs> work I mean, yeah. You, you That's what I was going to actually say was, like, if they can't figure out which one's me and not me, maybe I'll just withdraw my application. Well, yeah. <laughs> and I've said in kind of a blunt way, but I think you've given me a way to say it a little less blunt with you mentioned the, 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 um, the, the cultural fit. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody doesn't want to hire me because of what I've put online, be, and be, I put thought into what I've put online, I probably don't want to work there. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that's, and, and so I think it's, if they're going to be that concerned, mm -hmm over it and, and they've looked at me and they, they don't agree with it. any of your political or yeah, religious I mean, views you know, then it's probably not going to be a comfortable yeah. place for me to work. It helps you weed out the, your potential yeah, um, employers from yeah. the other side. Yeah. But I think I can get away with saying that because I put thought into over it. the years yeah. into what I've I know what I, I pretty yeah. much know what's out there. Well, and I think it depends upon the field you're going into too. I mean honestly librarianship is a rather small field and you get yeah. to know people and I think you know, it's pretty obvious that everybody's going to have an opinion, but it's about the job that you do. And right. and being unique in this field is probably an asset. Mm -hmm. It's not a hindrance. Where in other fields, that might not be the case. So sure. it depends upon, you know, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, honestly, they can't do a location search <laughs> to narrow you down. Or, you know, the other thing that I do, I you know, I have um, at the top of my CV where there's my name, contact, title, and that kind of thing, I put a a link to my faculty page, so mm -hmm. it's the and first I, thing. I list my, my yeah. website. So that they can get yeah. to it. So I think if you really can't figure out it's me, kind of at direct least them. Here's, the link to, <laughs> here's the link to it's who I am me. online. Yeah. But that's a good question. Yeah. And the other thing is something interesting. I'm not sure how this would even. What if they find you in a genealogical website? This person says their full name is in the genealogical database. Um, like birth and death? I guess, I'm not sure if this is their particular entry or is it like their name happens to be in the database and it's someone else. I think sure, genealogical sites you just have to disregard. Yeah, but, you know, and because I wouldn't think that's any employer a different would use that of, for any Yeah, resource. that's a different type of research. Yeah. And some of that's going to come up, but I mean, you could do a background check easier than. You're not going to get anything useful search. from there that would be uh -uh. for a job, I would think, in a genealogical Unless you're looking to see if they have family that Age. works in place. Age. Yeah, that would I mean, be you know, Unless generally they don't put your birth date on your resume for various reasons. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, mean, you know, part of the concern I'm having is if the only thing that comes up for you is a genealogical website, you need to do some work and get an online profile. Yeah, you need to I get mean, a I mean, seriously, if, if that is the it, is a person who's in a genealogical database, then I'd be concerned, like, who is this person? I mean, you should at least have something from school. Most schools will give you, you know, you can get in the newsletter, write, a, write something for that. Get a LinkedIn profile. Um, 
you know, job, there's got to be some place that you can start building your profile so that there is something out there. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, for for anybody who might be thinking, you know, nobody's going to be looking for me. I'm kind of back to my scenario of older librarian. Yeah. Just our the big talk for small libraries conference that we've done. We've just heard about somebody doing something in some small town and and have contacted them and said, hey, would you like to present at our conference? And that's someone who's probably, and, and I know this happened at least once or twice, has never never thought anybody would ever be looking for them to do something like that, and, and or the show or something. And, and that's where, you know, having a, a minimal online presence, mm -hmm. even though you don't think anybody will care, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. might, might help you out. Yeah. Oh, I agree. I mean, the more, I mean, self-promotion, you're your own brand. So mm -hmm. you can be as big or as little as you want to, but honestly, be you and maintain control over your identity. Right. You know, and, and that's the biggest thing. Generally, if you're not good advice. Own, yeah. yeah, if you're not going to dig your own website, which is cool, then do like LinkedIn and, and get a profile out there so people can track you yep. and find you yep. and share your expertise. All right. All right. Uh, any other questions from the audience? No, and you, you covered everything I was thinking. I think so, uh, <laughs> Marcia, thank you very much. Always these topics give everybody plenty of things to think about. So what I'm going to do real quick is I just got a couple of news items here. We're, we're, we're uh, a little over our hour already, but I just want to kind of point a few things out. Um, the uh, If you are an ebook buyer, and I'll just, it, these links will be in the show notes. I'm not going to bring up uh, all of these websites in the interest of time. Um, if you have been buying books from Kindle or Barnes & Noble, uh, check your email, check your spam mm -hmm. folder. Uh, there have been some class action lawsuit settlements, and you might have a credit uh, yeah. sitting $3. in. Three, you got three bucks? Oh, okay. Nine-something. Nine-something, nine and, and I generally don't buy e-books, so I haven't gotten anything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> got a lot of free books uh, uh, from, from there. Um, just announced yesterday, uh, Facebook has bought a company called Oculus uh, VR for $2 billion. Uh, they make a head-mounted uh, virtual reality display, which I have not had a chance to play with. But I will tell you, uh, some people have told me it's it's quite amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, also on the ebook front, if you have ever bought from a company called Diesel eBooks, uh, they are going out of business. Download your books by the end of the month, and uh, or else you will lose them. Uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Um, now, one. I am I am working on trying to find somebody who can present well on what Bitcoin is. It's a virtual currency, and I'm going to stop there. I understand it, but I don't feel comfortable enough presenting on it. I'm, I'm working on, on, on a few uh, leads there. But uh, the uh, IRS has basically said that if you have any of that, it is real money, and you have to pay taxes on it. So uh, virtual money that you will owe real taxes, so something you might uh, want to uh, pay attention to. Um, and then just found out this morning, Amazon has released a new service that they're starting to roll out called Amazon Workspaces, which is basically virtual desktops. Uh, I don't know if this has direct implications in, in most libraries, but uh, virtual desktops where you take any device, you log in, you get your desktop and your environment, but Amazon runs the whole service. You don't have to run the servers themselves. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the comment or question? Yeah, no, on, the IRS, no, that, mm -hmm. that was incorrect, sorry. If oh. They said that, no, they said the property. opposite. It's not currency, it's property. It's pro well, you still have to pay taxes so that on you it. Have to, that's how you right, have to sorry. In IRS, as far as it, in relation to the IRS. Okay, property, not income, not but currency. still not have to pay taxes on it. Right. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you for for that clarification. Um, yeah, I I found that article like an hour and a half ago, so I <laughs> just wanted to throw that in there. Um, so uh, that's that's it for my news. So uh, Krista, you. Oh, yeah. Then wrap it all up. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Michael and Marcia. Uh, the show has been recorded, as usual, so we'll be available um, soon, later today, <laughs> um, with all the show notes and everything. Um, so that'll wrap it up for this morning. I hope you'll join us next week when it is summer reading program time. Woohoo! Uh, Fizz Boom Read is the summer reading program um, the theme. For this year, and Sally Snyder will be doing her regular, her annual um, update of book talks. That will be good for both the children's and uh, teen theme for that. Um, and if you are a Facebook user, as we've just been talking about Facebook, uh, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so do like us there, and you'll get notifications of when we have new shows coming up, reminders that a show is starting, updates about when our um, recordings are available. Hmm? Oh. So um, if you are big in Facebook, please do um, go ahead and like us there. 
Other than that, that will wrap it up for today. Thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next week.